Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tyron Park, and I'm very proud to say that I am the executive producer of the Australian Musical Theatre Festival. It's a new job for me, and uh, I look forward to talking more about that coming up. Before we start today, and before we introduce our special first guest to this series of Sunday Soirees, uh, I just wanted to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm currently on, the Brimurong and Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And it always feels like uh, I, I tend to do lots of things in my world. I tend to run a course and direct in the industry. And now I find this amazing festival that I've been given charge of. And it's always a moment for me to stop and just ground myself when I do an acknowledgement of country and to remember that my life exists in telling stories. It exists in talking about music and song and dance. And when I remember that the traditional owners of this land have been singing their songs dancing their dances and telling their stories for many thousands of years before me. I find that very humbling indeed. Um, as we know, sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I think this year in particular, where we're so used to using Zoom and all these technologies where we're kind of connecting to each other in this strange way, I'm very aware that we're connecting from many countries inside of this nation and wanted to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, wherever you are zooming in from today or beaming in from or whatever technology we call it. Uh, thank you and thank you for joining us. So I'm gonna take a quick moment to talk about the Australian Musical Theatre Festival. Some of you uh, may have been, some of you may not know what this is about. Uh, it's my intention that you're gonna know quite a lot about it in the next few months. So the Australian Musical Theatre Festival started last year. If we all remember 2019, it feels like about a decade ago. Uh, and it was a wonderful festival. I went down there myself as a performer uh, and as a teacher. And I met so many amazing people. And it, it had this amazing energy about it. Suddenly all these people, all these theatre practitioners, all these people from around Australia who love musical theatre, who are interested in telling stories in this way, all met in Launceston, Tasmania, uh, for five days and, and engaged in conversations and classes and performances. And, and it, it really, you know, it's a strange place to think, well, you know, we go to Launceston to look at musical theatre, but what was wonderful about it was Launceston, the history, the, the culture, the community, and, and I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with the wine, I have to admit. Uh, I fell in love with the food. I fell in love with the, uh, the community and the theatre community there. And it was a wonderful place for everybody to emerge into. And it feels like this year, we started some conversations about musical theatre that are really important and really necessary. And so in taking over the festival, uh, I'm really excited about continuing those. And this is the start of those conversations, really, uh, that will lead us up to our announcement of the program before too long. So um, if you would like to know more about that, please head over to our website and you can register and we can send you some updates uh, throughout the year as we get ready to announce the festival. There's many, many wonderful things, wonderful performers, wonderful teaching moments and a real kind of look at musical theatre maybe outside of what it traditionally looks like. Um, I have very wide tastes in music theatre. I love Jerome Kern and I love Lin-Manuel Miranda. So uh, we really look forward to creating a festival where everyone has something that they love and uh, a festival that celebrates uh, inclusion and diversity and belonging in Launceston next May. So we hope to see you there. And this festival really, I mean, in a way, it's only five days, but it feels much bigger than that. And certainly what I'm interested in is, is creating conversations that last much longer. And I know I've been part of those conversations for young people who I met there, um, who I've now kept in touch with over the last few years, and, uh, and for you who might be coming along to join us. So um, in starting those conversations, I thought, well, maybe we could have a kind of Sunday soiree where each Sunday 
uh, I could welcome some wonderful practitioner for musical theatre. We could learn a little bit about what it's like. We could, we could gain access to some of these people and we could find what it is like to be a practitioner in this country in musical theatre. And, uh, you know, what it's been like this year, which has, let's face it, not been like any other year. And in thinking about who we should do this off with, uh, I did not go very far because I actually don't think in Australia we have many true, uh, what I refer to as triple celebrations. I don't think we have many people who equally act, sing and dance to an amazing level and can do so all at once as well. Um, my next guest has played roles, all the iconic roles really. I mean, think of Velma Kelly in Chicago, Anita in West Side Story, Mary Magdalene in Jesus Christ Superstar, Kathy in Singing in the Rain, Svetlana in Chess. They go on, and that's only the smallest amount. Um, and, and this is a wonderful moment because I really want the world to know that she is as wonderful and generous and open as a person as she is talented. Please welcome the remarkable Alinta Chidzi. Yay! Hi! Good Hi. <laughs> Hello, Tasmania. <laughs> and Tyron. Tyron and Tasmania. <laughs> Hello, my dear. I know that you're just around the corner from me. This is actually really strange to have you just up the road. We should have just had a cup of tea on your couch <laughs> there. Uh -uh. Absolutely. <laughs> that comes later. Thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are. And uh, even in, in amongst this crazy time, I've got a bunch of questions and then I'm going to hand over anybody watching who wants to ask your own question uh, and send it through. So I'll have some time for that. And also, I, I really thought rather than just talk about musical theatre, I wanted to hear some. And so we're going to have a wonderful moment where Alinta gets to share a song with us as well, which will be just awesome. So Alinta, I often get really intrigued by this. I, I often ask people because um, I, I want to find out where it comes from. So tell me, why theatre? How did you get involved in musical theatre? I think it's because I as an audience member was elated when I saw it. And I think that's what urged me to want to do it. I always had a connection to music um, that made me want to move, that made me want to sing, that made me, you know, engage in storytelling. Um, and that always captivated me, you know, and, you know, even when I was a young kid, I always watched, you know, Lion King and Aladdin. I loved the combination of, storytelling through music and dance and acting so it was that's what drew me to it um and i funnily enough saw a performance that my sister did at victorian college of the arts secondary school and it was you know i saw what a song and dance number in there and i went that's that's just what i want to do so then i just started you know training and seeing how i could get into it and um, yeah, I just was always passionate about it. It always moved me and that always had an energy that resonated. Did you have any um, uh, any challenges in terms of did, did people try and dissuade you or were you always pretty confident and had support around, around pursuing it? I have a very supportive family. My parents were amazing. They, you know, encouraged me and, you know, let me do what I want to do. So I was very grateful to be raised in a in a family that um, didn't judge me, you know, judge what I did and was always um, around and supported that vision. It's funny, you know, because I, I remember growing up and wanting to, I had the same. I, my, my family were very supportive and, and I also know some families that potentially weren't because it, it felt unsteady or unsafe as a career a career choice. But... I think we found out more and more that there are very few steady, safe career choices. And actually what kind of matters is what lights you up. You know, if, if it lights you up, you find a way. It's, it's how I think of it. Yeah. I mean, my partner, he's a musician and, you know, his family weren't super supportive of him following that as an actual career. There was always meant to be a backup plan. Like it was always encouraged to do that, yet it made his... Um, focus even more determined to pursue it because he really loved it. So I think no matter what scale you come from, I think 
if you're passionate about it, it will always shine through. So yeah, whether you that's... are from a family that thinks that it is or, you know, isn't, I think um, it takes a lot of um, determination, a lot of commitment and um, love for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And clearly you have that. Um, I I want to jump now. I want to jump to a, a different kind of question. I'm aware that there's many people joining us that are interested in getting into musical theatre. And there's also many people who are already in musical theatre who want to know really about, you know, not a lot of people in this country have the kind of success that you have. And I don't want to embarrass you, but you really have gone from sort of iconic role to iconic role. When you think about some of those roles that I mentioned at the start, they they sometimes have stamps of other people on them. You know, you a lot of people have played Velma Kelly around the world. A lot of people have played Mary Magdalene. A lot of people have played Anita in West Side Story. I just wondered how you go about um, finding your own version of, of those roles when they are so well known. Yeah, I, I got that question a lot. I mean, especially going into, I mean, two roles that Caroline O'Connor played, you know, that everyone did know her for and I think she's amazing and was part of the reason why, you know, when I was 16 I saw her and I just went, oh, my gosh, I want to play that role. So I I know that because when I was studying as well, I know that everyone as an actor or actress has their own innate storytelling that's unique to them. So I feel I would offer something very different to say Caroline or, you know, um, whoever's, you know, Cheetah Rivera, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I just know and I trust that if I do the work of, you know, whether it's studying the script or understanding the character, that I'm going to bring my own stamp to it. And I think that's really important for any young artist um, that's coming into the industry to know that and to really own it because it's, it's special. No one can do it like you do. So mm. I think I always remind myself that when I am looking at a character and go, okay, what way do I personally connect to this, you know, this particular character and what sort of themes are running through it that are uh, really important to me and, and I can tune in with that mm. will make it seem organic and, and really um, authentic. Mm. Mm. And I think, you know, it's sort of when 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 you work, do those roles that are part of the canon, there are kind of stamps on some of them. And sometimes, I mean, I find it's good to to know, to be aware and to choose and, and separate. And as you find, just as you say, find your own, because also we will look at Chicago in 2020 in a different way to what it might have been looked at in 1996 as well. So the, the audience lens changes as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was quite interesting, you know, with, you know, celebrity fame and how that's, it's still around but in a very, in a different way today, especially with social media and how things can be exploded and people really, you know, get taken away by that and, like, what's the truth underneath and what what is, you know, underlying in today's currency that's mm. so relevant. And I think not just myself but the people I play opposite will have an effect on how I play it like because yeah. they will give me, you know, something different and I have to really respond honestly to that within the realms of the story. Yeah, of course, of course. And yeah. look, I mean, I, I'm interested now as part of the Australian Musical Theatre Festival, I feel like it's part of our job to promote Australian musical theatre and to look at how we're developing in that and, and as we know, musical theatre and what we're becoming more and more aware of has had a, a kind of narrow viewpoint because it's been written by a narrow range of people. It's not a very diverse um, team of writers traditionally. Um, I actually met you when you originated a role in a production in, Austra in an Australian musical. Um, how different is that? So you're going into a show where there is no blueprint. It's so different from West Side Story you know, singing in the rain, those kinds of shows. What What is the difference when you're just, you're the first person? I think it gives you the liberty to make bold choices and um, to trial different things to see what works. Um, it makes you delve into the script, you know, just as much. I think, it, you know, whatever you're playing, whether it's existing or not, 
I think you always have to refer back to the script to really, you know, do your detective work and find out all the, the details, you know, and, and things that make someone human, you know, what are their faults, what are their drives, what are what is it that's missing, what is, what's the challenge within the piece and how do I find that within myself? Um, and I think sometimes, and, you know, even with comedy, even with doing Chicago, um, I still found myself finding things throughout the season because the audience also gives me that feedback of what comedy is working and it'll be different night to night it'll be different mm -hmm. from a matinee to a, a night show because of the the demographic that's in the audience so that's also another thing to play into but um i think doing an original work it's really it's really just you know trialing something and, and seeing if it works and seeing if that lands well with you with the journey of the character it's kind of exciting, isn't it, to to know you're the you're the one making it. It doesn't happen very often in this country. I I okay. hope it happens more. I hope and, it happens more too. <laughs> my my feeling also is that as an actor, when you approach a new text, you you really have to fight for your own character, and you have to fight you have to, to fight to kind of interpret the notes and and the words in a way that if something is already deemed a success over a hundred years you don't necessarily do that same work. And I find that that rigour is then really helpful when you go back to something that has been set up because you know that somebody did that work and you need to honour that work. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, um, what happens, how do you deal with, you write down to the end, let's say for Velma Kelly or, you know, Anita in West Side Story, one of these big roles, you know you're auditioning against some other very talented people in the room. How do you stay focused without getting ahead of yourself? How do you walk into that final callback and and navigate what what is the anticipation of like, you know, it, when we're this close? How do you navigate those nerves? Um, I mean, for me, it, there's a lot of excitement, so it's. You know, it's nerves coming from a good place. I think it's a great thing to have. I think when nerves are there, it's because you care. I think um, what's really important is to listen. I think, you know, the director will usually give you notes or whether it's the choreographer or, you know, the music director. I think it's really important to listen because then it, it shows that you're receptive to what they're going to give you. And sometimes... I remember auditioning for Broadway to Oz, which was the Hugh Jackman tour, and I reckon they gave us the hardest, hardest routines you can imagine because they wanted to see how you took the challenge and then if they gave you something, okay, now do a triple turn to the left, everyone went, oh, <laughs> you know, but it's how you take it and I think that's also part of the audition process is they want to know if you can be directed or you can you know, withhold, withhold sort of a um, intense, you know, rehearsal period where you're going to be challenged. Mm. Um, and trust, if you know, if you've, you've done the work, trust your own instincts and being open and listening will help that happen in the room. Does that get easier as you get older? I mean, I, I think I hear you and I go, absolutely, like, has that over your time got easier? That's like a lot to take on. If you think about your first auditions. Oh, um, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah, absolutely. Because I think, you know, sometimes it can be a bit deer in headlights when yeah. you're first auditioning and it's really hard to stay centred and whether that, you know, you meditate to ground yourself, whether you listen to music. I think everyone has their own way of finding a centeredness. Um, and I think remembering that the panel actually want you to be right for the part it is there, you know, it's not wasting their time and it's not wasting their money. So you've got to remember that you've been asked to come into the room for a reason and trusting that, you know, that they want you. Um, and, it you know, in those moments also you realise that it's not, necessarily how good you are it's just if you're fitting the puzzle of like who's playing the other role 
or so there's so many factors that can come in but all you can control is what you can control and that's how you prepare how you listen and connect how you um yeah you present yourself be a nice person like it's just mm-hmm. all of those all of those things come into play and that's what i've learned over the years and i think that's why i found it easier to let go of auditions and when i've come really close it can be difficult i'm not saying it's not and it still is at times when you really want to roll but in the end it's just you know it's time and place and if you're right for the project and sometimes well, it goes away and sometimes it, a lot of the time it it doesn't and and that's okay yeah, I actually wanted to ask, because it's funny you say that, I wanted to ask what you do with um, disappointment. And and it's just a part of, you know, in this past week I've been doing the callbacks for the VCA, Victorian College of the Arts um, auditions, and, and out of the over 500 people who auditioned, only 20 people are getting in. So that's a lot of people who are, who are dealing with a no, who are, who are coming up against a no. Um, do, I, I'm, I'm interested in what you do when you like when you sit inside of disappointment. Is there something that you can share with us that you? How do you look after yourself? Because it's interesting to hear. We just assume we look at your amazing list of credits, um, and we, you know, it looks very different from the outside. It looks like you get everything, and and obviously there's those those moments that that don't go your way. And I just wondered, yeah, if you could share anything about that. I think it's important to feel the disappointment. I think it's human. I think it's also to do with, you know, I've been talking a lot about mental health recently, just within everyone's world and especially within the arts, it's been quite challenging. So I, and then what I've learned by also talking to others is it's okay to feel the disappointment. It's, it's human and if we don't feel it, then it may sit there and manifest there for a while and come up in other ways of, anger or so many other things that you might react in a straight strange way to certain things but it's okay to sit quietly and go ah oh, that's really hard to take and 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 have that moment whether it's a day or two it may, maybe longer uh everyone's different with how they process it but it's okay to go oh this is really tough right now but then you know <laughs> A wise man told me once, um, I was travelling through Thailand, he said, nothing lasts forever. It's everything changes over time. So these feelings, you know, will pass. So I think it's that um, understanding of of that it's okay and to go on that roller coaster ride. And then, and then, you know, so many times I've had that where I've gotten so close to something and then the next you know, month or something is the perfect role for me. Like it's so, it's so strange. I've had that. You know, one door closes, another one opens. Absolutely, and I think. Uh, by the way, um, Jetson just made a little cameo in the back there. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, I've got two cats, and uh, if they if they have a little row, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm apologising. Well, uh, you know, it, it's all it's all part of the excitement. It's, it's, it's Jets and the sharks. We'll you know we'll just play some music under it, and it'll, it'll go viral. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, what do you do when you're not on stage? Because as you say, you know, sometimes the, you know, if if you're not in a long run, what, what, how do you, how do you um, keep yourself busy when you're not on stage? Are there other things that you do? Um, So if I'm, completely going away from the arts I usually I'm a I'm a big nature person so I love to get out I love to do hikes treks out in in national parks um go on a holiday it's so good and refreshing and usually when that happens you book something (laughs) but uh I I think it's really important to have the balance I think um it's been really interesting with COVID hitting to have that allow that time to stop and reflect on what's actually important to you in life. And you, I think it feeds you also to have the balance of, you know, going, going, whatever it is you're passionate about that's not to do with the arts, I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you know, love seeing my friends and family. So I, I'm a big social person and love going out and seeing them. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's nice to unwind 
And then it also can make you more motivated when you come back and go, okay, I've got the energy to come back and do something else. And you also work like not just like you know within the arts you work outside of musical theatre as well. You you kind of, you have your own band. You have your own like where, where does that where does that come from? What, what does it tell us about that? Um, I think I've always dreamt when I was before having a band. I always wanted to, and I always um, loved jazz. So I sort of went down that path and you know dipped my toes into that and going oh this is something I really enjoy. You know, it keeps me interactive with an audience. It keep, and then I learnt so many skills from actually talking to to a to a live audience. It's really different instead of playing a character to then going, okay, I've got to break the fourth wall and I've got to, you know, communicate and engage, you know, in conversation sometimes with people. Um, it gave me the ability to um, explore a different part of my voice. It also um, gave me liberty on, on just choosing different songs to sing and see what things I love. And also then I started writing as well because I thought, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying singing other people's songs, but I think I've got something to offer as well in reflecting in things that I, you know, care about. So that's, um, that's why I started a band and, and it's been great because, you know, I've learned about producing my own stuff this, you know, it also opened up my mind to what other people do in our industry. That is so it's so important to understand what producers do, what stage managers do, what you know, sound and lighting, and just knowing everyone's job and and appreciating and respecting every department in what we do. You know, a lot of theatre people can get a bit caught up in them just themselves, and oh, but it's all about me. But actually, mm. it's a team effort and. The more you can be grateful and understand, you know, it's a it's a company, then I think you'll have a, a better career for that reason. I actually also think there's just like I was once, you know, obviously I, I teach and I direct and and you know sometimes perform uh, and do those things. And somebody I remember people talking about that and about the necessary kind of diversifying in Australia about you know understand producing your own work and um and i remember just thinking why would you not because it's so interesting like all of these all of these different ways are all there with one pursuit which is to tell the story but they all come from different you know like costume design and as you say stage management yeah. and you know so so many elements and i think that's another thing, just, you know, back to the festival because I'm plugging the festival wherever I can. Um, <laughs> um, Love it. That, yeah, um, that we want, we, want to, we want to kind of give classes for producers and directors and, and, and give people the chance to sit in something that's not their only focus so they understand how theatre is made. And I think it's going to be interesting because there potentially is going to be less material coming from a while for a while from places like New York and London. Um, and so we might be in a position where we are creating a little more. I think that would be a good thing for Australia and, and a good thing for sort of finding finding our voice in, in amongst all of this. And you talk about jazz and your your um, your band, and I just thought you've done so many styles in musical theatre. Like if you think about a little night music, it's like, it's like an operetta. And then you think about... Um, Chicago and it's a jazz musical and then you, you you know you think about all the all the you know Andrew Lloyd Webber you know the work you've done on on his work both in the the concerts and in Jesus Christ Superstar do you have a favorite do you have a favorite style you like to perform in I mean I have to say that I mean the two two things I've oh god well it's really hard I I enjoy delving into different styles I think that's, I love being a chameleon. Um, obviously, because I, I love jazz, you know, Chicago really fit, I felt, my voice very well. But then again, I, you know, I did Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder and that was just such a completely different sound as well. And I, I loved that, you know, style and that text. And, um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's just so much to find within each style that I don't ever want to limit myself. I never want to feel boxed in, you're a, you know, 
pop belter, you know, and I, and that's what I was a lot at the time when I first started with music theatre and I was like, but I've actually got this soprano voice that never, like mezzo-soprano voice and no one hears just because of what was mm. being produced. But if you were to do your own show, you will, people will see that you do different material and go, oh, my gosh, I didn't know you had that voice in you. Oh, I'm going to consider you for that. Like that's the other, the positive you could get out of doing your own material, out of like writing or performing different styles. Um, and I think that's what I have got out by doing my own stuff is that I felt very independent. I didn't feel desperate for the musical. I didn't feel like I went into the room like I have to get this job and because the panel feel that they know they're like oh god okay yep yep <laughs> whereas <laughs> I felt like hey I've got this and and I I'm I really love doing this material if I'm right great we can work together <laughs> but it's it's a different confidence of going I don't have to land this job I've, I can if if you want me to um and, and I, I guess also thinking about that Lindsay go Musical theatre isn't a style in itself. I mean, you, you might do Cats and you might do Hamilton and you might, you might do a little night music and have to, as you say, be a chameleon and morph into those things. And I guess I heard you recently talking to a group of students at BCA and you were talking about listening to music as well, like hearing the influences of, of different music, which I'm sure helps you shift you know shift into that kind of world and then another kind of world yeah absolutely yeah i think the more you can be a chameleon it's like doing accents it's like going oh i've got an ear i can hear the difference why that's a different accent or why that's a different style of of music theater um mm. to really understand the tone of it is great too I wanted to ask you, and I just wanted to make everyone aware that we will have um, about just over 10 minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions they would like Alinta to answer, then please send them through and uh, we'll, we'll bring them up for her. But just before we jump to that, um, Alinta, obviously we were all quite disappointed that we wouldn't get to see you as Martha in The Secret Garden this year. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you have roles ahead that you dream of playing? Can we just hear the wish list? Can we, can we, can we, <laughs> Do you know what? I always get this question and I'm always like, oh, God, what are, what, how do I answer this? But actually recently what's popped into my mind is actually Sweet Charity. Um, I was watching um, the Fosse Verdon series and I was just like, oh, that, that is a great role. That is a fantastic role to play. And, um, you know, I just, that, that one thing that popped in my head of going, oh, God, that would be incredible. So um, that's definitely one. I um, don't know if I've got any others. If I, I mean, I'm sure some more Sondheim stuff would be amazing too. <laughs> so, you know, um, great text. Um, yeah, that's probably the main one that popped into my head. But yeah. yeah. I can see it. I can imagine. And just so you know, we're all dreaming up roles for you, so you don't have to put much energy into that. We'll <laughs> take care of that. Let me know. Then I'll maybe think about it. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> then I'll have um, a good answer for something else. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, before I go to some questions, um, what, if anything, has 2020 taught you? So <laughs> it's, been, it's been an interesting time, and I just wonder with the... Obviously, you were going to go in, you know, it started out extraordinarily well. They were on stage, you know, in, in Chicago, about to go into, you know, Australian Opera's The Secret Garden. We all know what happened. We all lived in this, we all live in the same world. What what has this period taught you? Have you have you found anything that you didn't know about yourself or about the way you deal with things this year? Um I think it, it was it was the uh, it was a very busy year leading up. So I was when it first hit, I was like, oh, I can breathe for a moment. It was actually quite a relief of like, okay, I can stop for a minute. Um, um, and you know, I think uh, as a woman in this industry, it was really hard for me to know when would be a good time to be, you know, to to have a child. <laughs> so I actually 
you know, thought, okay, well, maybe this is the opportunity. So, okay, so thought, before you do this, before you do this, I, like this was like <laughs> when I was going, what role is coming up next, Alinta? I think we have an announcement ha happening here. <laughs> Tell us about, about your next role in life. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then I just, you know, I, I think it, in the back of my mind I was like, oh, gosh, I'm not sure when it's going to be possible um, with, you know, it being amazingly booked for, for work and, and, of course, I'm, I'm always grateful for that. But then I was like, oh, gosh, you know, we have a time limit as a, as a, as a woman and um, so then I just was like, okay, see what happens. And so I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah. So that is, it's been um, quite amazing. And, I mean, I'll go into this too, but, um, you know, when we talk about the song and that sort of thing as well, but I, it's amazing how much I feel like I've changed emotionally and, um, you know, seeing what things can really, you know, there's more than just theatre you know there is life and that is so important and also you know connecting with the people that you love whether it's your family whether it's your friends it's that is something that's always going to be an underlying current whether through through your roller coasters you know through my roller coasters um has been a very very important part of my life and and not to be defined by my work you know, I think that's a big lesson to learn because I think a lot of people don't feel valued when you're not working, and um, it's it's a, it's a big lesson to learn because um, you you may feel like you're not important enough, but you are, and and the more you can delve into understanding yourself, I think that feeds your acting work, and um, can only make you grow you know, better as a, as a person but also as an actor. Yeah, and it's that sometimes we, I think, uh, it's so seductive musical theatre that we come sometimes forget, and you know, about valuing the other parts of our, our worlds. And I, I know it was Chekhov that said, if you want to be a good actor, you work on your life. Yeah, oh. <laughs> you, work, you work on your life. Like and I can't tell you, like, the things that have come up now that I look... The other day I was singing, you know, I'd give my life for you. And now being pregnant with a child inside, I'm just like this has a completely different meaning to me because I'm going through life and this is making it richer to draw upon. Like it's a, it's a gift, you know. Um, even the saddest things in life are a gift to your growth as a person and as an actor. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. And I have to say um, the world needs more of a Lynch Chidsey in it. So I was thrilled, thrilled when I found out. And it's just <laughs> wonderful that that's your next role. It's very exciting. I'm going to take a couple of questions in our chat. Um, one here says, uh, what do you do to keep yourself in the zone in those periods in between jobs? where you might go months without performing in a show? How do you keep show fit when you're not doing it every night? Um, it is really important. Like exercise has been, I mean, also in COVID times, exercise has been so important. One, for your physical health, but also your mental health. I feel like that really helps. Um, you know, I run a lot. I, I do Pilates, um, play tennis. It's been really great to play tennis. I feel like it gets you out of your head because you're really focusing on the ball. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, no, um, when, when Hugh, Hugh uh, Jackman did um, uh, Sunset Boulevard, that's how they rehearsed. They rehearsed on the tennis court lobbing lines to each other. It was like, and, you know, the, the nature of, like, connecting to your partner as well. Absolutely. Like art and life. But. Yes, continue. How, so it's exercise and, and what exercise, other things? Exercise, um, you know, keep up, find repertoire that you need to work on or know, you know, know the things that um, you need to work on. I'll give you an example that I, you know, I, I remember the transition of going from ensemble to playing roles and I always remember going, I, need, I, I really feel like I need to work on my acting more. I've, I've 
just you know, I know I didn't train at you know a VCA or WAPA or any you know tertiary institution. I had done things separately, and you know I trained at VCAS for um, for dance, um, and I kept up all the other things, but I just knew that I needed to delve in a little further to doing you know roles. So I I went away and worked on on acting, and I think it's knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, and knowing okay, I know that when I audition, I may be a little bit not as secure in this area. And if that's the case, then work on it. And, um, you know, and also challenge yourself with new material. I think that's a great thing to do. You know, I remember in, in COVID time too, like I read plays with people because I was like, well, that's something we can do. We can do it online. And I can find out some new material through that and just look at new writing and, um, you know, watch other people cold read things as, and see how that is. Um, there's, there's just lim- unlimited things that you can do, um, whether you want to write, whether you, you know, there's, I, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even laugh. there's so many things. Yeah. can never get bored. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I never want to I never want to work with artists that are bored with life. There's always so much more. So much more. Um I've got some sneaky ones coming through uh my email as well, some questions that aren't as well. But I'm gonna go to one that's come through with um when you have to prepare for a song of your own choice for an audition, do you try and learn something new or do you do a song you know well? Uh depends how much time you have. I think mm-hmm. Uh, you want to go in feeling confident. So I would go with something you know. Uh, if mm-hmm. you have enough time that you, to prepare for something that is quite relevant and maybe will put you in a better stead in the, in, the, in the audition process because of the way it connects to maybe the character or the story or the, the style of music that you may not have, then I would go for that. Um yeah, generally I would go with that. just make sure you're confident with the material more than anything. And um, that's why in these times it's great to build up your repertoire uh, of different genres. Do you have a secret weapon, you know, one that just gets you the job? You know, some, uh, some actors just go, oh, always, if I get to sing this song then I get the job. No, I don't think I've got that. <laughs> you, know Rod Waterworth? You, know, you know Rod Waterworth in Melbourne, yeah. beautiful Rod. He's done so many shows. You know, you go to places like BCA and those places and they teach you about getting your repertoire and all of that. Rod only ever had Sammy Made the Pants Too Long or I Got Rhythm with a Tap Break. That's the only two two songs he ever had and he got so many shows. So go figure. Go figure. Go figure. Go figure. Everyone tells me. Know. And if you're, yeah. well, if you're then great. Absolutely. Look, um. I'm just going to go over. I've actually got a bunch that have come through. Um, people are texting me and being cheeky and not putting them in the chats. Um, you've already <laughs> played some terrific roles, but almost every performer has certain roles on their must-do parts. I think we sort of talked about that in a way, about what's on your must-do, and I think next up is is being mum, yeah? So we'll, um, <laughs> we'll just make that one as red. And then, and then charity and all the other ones that I've got in store for you. Uh, Patria says, hi, guys, I was wondering how you inspire yourself to work on your weakness despite how uncomfortable and difficult it can be. So, uh, Linda, you know, I don't expect you to tell us, uh, you know, if you're a singer after dancer first or whatever, but how do you inspire yourself to work on the hard stuff? Um, I, I think it's like getting, um, you know, some people can get criticism in, like in the wrong way it's actually constructive criticism and I actually think it's a blessing that if you ever walk away from an audition you, and I think it's great also follow-up auditions and go okay why do you why didn't that why didn't I get the, to the next round or why didn't I get if you can find out from the casting director I think it's such valu- valuable valuable um lessons to learn um I think we have to put ourselves in uncomfortable positions to know um, just to, to grow further. I think, you know, the work never stops. I, I will never stop learning. So I think that um, 
know by going to challenge yourself and, and going, oh, I don't feel comfortable with um, singing this style or, you know, pushing myself in that or trying this thing. I'm not very sensual. I don't, I don't know how to. I think it's really important to break those barriers because that will make you more evolved as, as an actor and, and a performer in general. Mm. And if it's mm. dance, go do a class. Look, go and do it. You know, there's there's classes around. So, um, you know, ask people where to go and and make sure you do it. And, and the same with acting and for singing, I think. Yeah, there are teachers in every, I mean, they're great teachers. And, and yeah, you, and I always think go towards, go towards the scary thing. Go towards the one that you go, you know, I've just got it. And then balance it with just being gentle with yourself around that stuff as well. Yeah. John X is told us that Patria is about to play the lead in Heather's. Yes, I know. I know this information, John X. I know. And hello, John X, uh, who works beautifully uh, with us at the festival as well. Um, I've got another one here that these are, there are a bunch of these. These are some of the ones that are coming through um, in the website and things as well. Um, what is your technique for hand, handling audition nerves and do you still get them? Good question. Um, I think I, I touched on it a little bit before. It's it's knowing that if you can prepare as much as you can, that's a massive one. I think that will just sort of go, okay, I've done my work, now I've got to trust. Um, I think the other thing would be um, be present, you know, that, that helps with listening. If you're doing a scene, it's like tennis. You don't If you don't look at the ball coming over and see what's happening, you're going to miss it, you know. So it's really it's being present in the room and, and have, having done all the work, um, do things that make you feel settled and grounded. Be there early if that if that's the case. Some people don't want to be there early. Some people want to arrive like just before because they don't want to be in the room with a million people and that's how they work. But you've got to know what works for you to calm you, you know, and breathe. Breathe is... Breathe. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Um, whether it's, you know, go for a run in the morning that gets out all your nerves out or some sort of form of exercise is great. I think that gets you in your body because um, we can get in our head a lot. So I think yeah. being in your body really helps ground yourself um, within the work. Awesome. Beautiful. Uh, Belinda King, another one of our wonderful people who, looks, who works with us uh, at the Australian Musical Theatre Festival has asked when you walk into the room on day one of rehearsal if the script and score have been pre-supplied how well prepared are you it's a very detailed question Belinda I love this for example are you all but booked down on the script and ready to work with the director on interpretation or have you spent time with the pianist working through the score then ready to work on interpretation or like what do you come with on day one I like to be pretty thorough with my material um, also, depending on how long you have, is if you've got a short amount of time, I would be off book. Just be off book. I think it allows you to have the ability to play and and you know try all different things and see what works without going. Uh, uh. <laughs> I think that really helps um, with the material um, to know it well. Um, but you've also got to be open, so. I think I think knowing it helps to a degree, but then being really open to what the director may give you. Um, don't feel like this is my way and it's a highway. I think it's good to, you know, feel it out, um, know it enough to feel like you've got a choice or a couple of choices up your sleeve and go, oh, actually, you know what, I've, I know, discuss it with the director and go, I've made these choices um, but I, I've thought about this way as well. Like I think that helps the conversation of what the character is and 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 maybe some things work differently with different um, actors as in your op op oppo opposing actor to you. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I like to go and prepare. That's just something that I do. Um, some people, like Mitchell Butel, oh, my God, I don't know how he did Gentleman's Guide with not knowing that fully. And we had a very, very short amount of time for production company. I was like, oh, my God, I'd be so stressed. You know, and that, that's the thing of, like, you don't want to feel stressed. You know, I think you want to know it 
I mean, you everyone works differently. Some people are, are better at being, okay, cool, I think I've got that and it will be fine. But if it makes you feel like you're losing the plot, then maybe not. <laughs> and, and as someone who has directed you, you are very good at coming in prepared with choices but able to shift them. You sit in that beautiful area of going, of not being so locked down that they are cemented in and you can't shift, but mm. coming to the office. And so that that always speeds the process up, which is amazing. Um, I'm getting um, questions. Everyone's coming in at the last minute, which is great, except that we're going to speed through a little now. Thanks, Belinda, for that. Wendy, how do you get over things if you don't have a good feeling about your op op opposite partner, especially if it's a romantic role? What do you do? It's a hard one. Um, you would, for me, I would. Um, there's a there's an exercise you can do with, say, okay, I'm looking at the person's face and and a certain feature of their face, whether it's their eyes, their hair, um, a mannerism. You personalize that with someone that does make you feel that. I think. Um, I think you've got to find something mm. that helps you mm. connect to that feeling that um, that makes you, you know, then can make it believable. So I think personalising an aspect of the other actor um, mm. will help you with that. Mm. Beautiful. There's always something you can find. There's always something there, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a question here from Del Polden, and then we're going to jump to a um uh, a song in a second. As a teacher, I'm always concerned about the health of my students' voices. Yep, fair enough. Sometimes difficult to get young people to understand how important this is, however. How do you protect your voice to prepare for a lifetime of singing? Great question. Yes. Um, you Being safe with your voice is very important. I think warming up, warming down, having good technique, um, knowing, okay, if my voice is feeling tired, is it, so is this in rehearsal or is this like always preparing for something or just? This is sort of generally what you do yeah, to right. get. I think well, I'm most interested in that in that conversation as a when you're in the show and you've got to do eight shows a week because that's when you really kind of are using your voice a lot. Absolutely. I mean, all the things that most people would probably know is like warm up, warm down, sleep is so important, hydration, eating well, you know, unfortunately not partying can't do that <laughs> um, but it is such an important thing and I think doing eight shows a week if it's a very demanding vocal role if you're, you're feeling like you're going into danger with your voice stop like it's it's okay to stop you know we are human and we do have colds like I had bronchitis at one stage and I was like oh my god but it's life and I would rather take a show off than ruin my voice and not be able to do another show or another two months of shows because I've done damage. I think it's such a, um, we in Australia are such martyrs and I, there's it's something I love about it because we're hardworking but we're also beat ourselves up for when we take time off. But if you're not going to deliver a good show and are thinking about that in the show, you're not going to be happy with your actual performance that you're delivering to that audience that night. So I think it's more important to actually, you know, preserve this this special gift that you have. Um, yeah, look after yourself, definitely. Steam. I mean, another I guess one. We've had a few. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a few questions about preparation. And that's as much preparation is just getting your technique ready for the demands of a role, I would think. I mean, just preparing yourself. And, and you know, technique is everything. Technique is what's underneath so that you can go into a, a show and play and investigate story. You can't do it if you're going to damage yourself. So, um, And I, I know from somebody who, you know, uses sometimes opposing techniques with singing and dancing, um, you know, preparing yourself and understanding your technique has has held you in great stead for all these very demanding roles. 
I now, I know that there are some more questions we didn't get to. So next time people jump in early and get them in um, because I, I don't want to go over. Um, and there's some really lovely, you know, some friends in that chat. It's so nice to see. Tracy Case, haven't seen you in forever. Oh, All my God, Tracy people. Case. Hello. <laughs> All Sorry, I'm just seeing the messages now. I had it on something else and I didn't see yeah. it. They're all there. <laughs> lovely. It's so lovely. But as I said, I, I just think there's so many places and, and pe people talking about music theatre. And I think when you want to look at musical theatre, you want to hear it. And and so I asked Alinta to record a song for us today, um, especially for us here at the festival. And Alinta, I just wanted to ask if you wanted to set up the song, where it's from and, and, and what it, the song is about in the show. Um, so I've chosen um, uh, With You, which is from Ghost. Um, it's a song that I, when I heard it and I've, I've you know, lost someone recently, it's, it's something I connected to, so that's why I chose it. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's about this woman who's lost her partner and she's processing that and it's so difficult, um, someone who, that she loves and, and is trying to work out the reality of that and how to deal with that and how people are looking at her, you know, thinking she's a little bit gone, a little bit nuts. But um, it's, it's you know, there's so much love in it and um, a human connection and, and how important people are to you in your life. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, I hope you like it. <laughs> A beautiful moment in that show and people who haven't necessarily seen the show you might remember the movie with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore and it's it's the Demi Moore character um yeah as you say coming to terms with the loss and so um it's one of those beautiful music theatre moments where we open our hearts and thank you for recording it and I'd love to have a listen <laughs> This morning, I don't know why, I don't know why, Mr. Reynolds said to say hello, I started to cry, I started to cry. Every place we ever walked And everywhere we talked I miss you You never leave my mind So much of you Unfinished conversations we used to have still speak to me, and I write you letters every day that I'll never send and you'll never see. All this wishful thinking gets me no.
Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Linda. This, people don't know how hard that is to just to sing and connect the lyric. You are remarkable. That's before you even step foot on a dance in a dance uh, stage in a dance musical. Thank you so much for your time. We are so thrilled that you are pregnant. We are so grateful to you at the Australian Music Theatre Festival. These conversations are conversations that I want to continue with many people for a long time. Thank you for sharing your talent and just your generosity of spirit is absolutely My pleasure. Beautiful. Thank you, Thank for you so me. much. <laughs> and for everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as I said, these are the kind of conversations that we want to continue at the festival. They're the kind of conversations that we all continue through classes and through amazing practitioners, people like Alinta. Um, you know, the questions around vocal health will have all of those people to, there to talk to us about those kinds of things. And, uh, and it continues next week as well, next Sunday, where I have not one, but two beautiful guests. Next week, I'm very, very excited to interview um, two friends of mine, both who are, are probably had such amazing careers, but are probably most known through Mamma Mia. Next week, I am interviewing uh, Anne Wood and Natalie O'Donnell. So some of you will know that Anne Wood was the um, Donna in Mamma Mia when it first came to this country, and Natalie was Sophie, her daughter. And then we cut to several years later, when Natalie took on the role of Donna. And I thought it would be a really nice conversation to look at the differing viewpoints of that show, of their lives, and how they navigate musical theatre. Thank you so much for being with us. It's just wonderful. Thank you, Alinta. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>